All right, well, <clears throat> hey hackers, my name is Blue Cosmo, or in this case, or more commonly known as Chris Taylor. Um, today I will be doing a lecture off of cryptography for you guys. Um, more importantly, about how we can break ciphers, right? Um, cryptography is something that is very important within our digital world, and it comes very important within cybersecurity. And you may not completely be familiar with all the concepts of cryptography, but by the time we finish this presentation, you be, should be able to know. Um, those types of things, right? So a little synopsis for basically what the presentation is about. Um, the presentation kind of will teach you everything from the core principles to, um, sorry, let me present my screen. There you go. So um, synopsis for this presentation, it will teach you everything from the core principles to like the advanced topics within cryptography. Um, cryptography um, can get very complicated at times, but it should be very easy to, or it should be very easy to follow for you guys because of the way I have it structured. Um, Cool. So a little bit on who I am before we dive into uh, this. Sorry, whole thing. Chris, but um... um, so a little bit on who I am. My name is Chris Taylor. I am the chief executive officer of Cosmodium CS. Cosmodium is a cybersecurity education company where we teach general cybersecurity concepts to the general public. Um, I also work as a security educator and a malware developer, and finally a, a YouTuber. Um, I do have my YouTube channel linked here within the socials. So if you want to learn a little bit more about me and who I am, uh, feel free to check out those links. All right, so some foundations or general requirements for the presentation. If you don't know anything about cryptography, that's perfectly fine. Um, I make it easy to kind of follow along. So just try your best, have fun, and be willing to learn something new, right? Um, <clears throat> however, if you want to be able to follow along a little bit more successfully or easily, um, things like algebra, um, general Python or computer programming languages, the understanding of computer systems, and if you have like a security Linux distribution like Kali or Parrot, um, you should be able to follow along with some ease. Cool. So I have the presentation broken out into stages, right? So this is stage zero. After each stage, I'm totally here to answer any questions that you guys may have on the topic we may have just previously covered. All right. So this is kind of the importance of cryptography, right? So what is cryptography well cryptography it tends to be a pretty boring subject it isn't always the most um fun thing to learn however i hopefully can change your mind about that kind of topic at the end of this presentation right um it also is full of math um cryptography is what allows us to kind of secure these communications throughout the digital or digital world and um math is a very important part of that and you'll see that very prominently within this presentation. Um, it is also weirdly complicated, right? It's supposed to be secure. The more complex it is, the more secure it can be. And, um, but ultimately cryptography is the secure or the practice of secure communications, right? Um, where do we see cryptography, right? Well, we see cryptography pretty much in everyday life. Um, it basically is what is protecting your digital life. Um, it allows, you know, computers to authenticate you as a user. Um, it can protect your banking and financial information. Um, emails, cloud storage, right? If you store things on like Google um, Google Drive or anything like that, um, cryptography is what allows that information to stay secure, right? It's also why you need to have a password for a lot of your accounts and such, um, all based and centered around cryptography. So why is cryptography important? Um, if you're in the security field, you may be familiar with the rockyou.txt file, right? It's basically this file containing the passwords of 32 million users uh, from the data breach of the rockyou company. Um, we can inspect the rockyou file in our security Linux distributions, right? It comes pre-installed with any of these security Linux distributions. However, if you do not have it, I have it linked within this rockyou attachment and I will share the slides with you guys towards the end of this presentation in case you guys want to check them out. So let's navigate to the actual rockyou.txt file, right? So we can actually use the CD command, right? Change our directories into the user share word list path, right? That path is where a lot of the word list for security Linux distributions are set or are stored. Um, so simply we can use the ls command to list and we can see that our rockyou.txt file is right here. For whatever reason, if your rockyou.txt file ends with a .gz, it just means it's zipped. So you can simply use this command to unzip it and you can examine the file with this. So let's start to explore some of these passwords, right? So if we run this command on the rockyou.txt fi file, we can see all the passwords that are containing 
the section of password one, two, three, right? Basically the cat command will uh, concatenate or display all the file contents. And by using the grep command, we're basically filtering out the contents for password one, two, three. Now we can see that in this rocku.txt file, there's password one, two, three, one, two, three, four, all the way to six, seven, eight, nine, all these passwords that are contained, um, password one, two, three. Now, basically any hacker with access to this file can use or iterate through the passwords within this file and run them on your accounts and see, hey, we got a match and basically get access to your account, um, which is pretty interesting, right? So if your password is actually on the rocky.txt file, you can barely easily be hacked, right? Now, the rocky.txt file was named after the actual company Rocky. They were the company that was hacked in 2009 due to that SQL injection attack. Now, where Rocky really went wrong with this is, right, because what the hacker did with this file is that they didn't hold it for ransomware. They didn't um, sell it against the company, didn't sell it on the dark web. They simply uploaded it to the internet, right? And basically anybody with access to the internet had access to all 32 million credentials um, that the hacker were from the Rocky.txt company, right? Now, what was very faulty of the company is that they stored all the passwords in something called plain text. Plain text is simply just human readable text. This entire slide is in plain text, right? You can easily read, you can easily understand what it says. So instead, Rocky should have introduced basic cryptographic principles to base, basically secure those communications, right? So this is kind of where we're entering this new stage um, of cryptography fundamentals, right? Any questions before I continue? Um, it looks like pretty clear. Cool. Awesome. So stage one is cryptography fundamentals, right? How do we secure communications? Um, first of all, we have something called encryption, right? Encryption is basically the process of turning readable information that we call plain text into unreadable information that we'll call ciphertext, right? You can see here that we have this AA, which represents our plain text. You can read it. It says the letter A twice. It's being converted into this ciphertext, and you basically can't read that. If you were to look at this or if a computer were to look at this, it's non-readable, right? You can't understand the information at hand, therefore it's ciphertext, right? So encryption is basically that process of turning plain text into ciphertext. Now we have decryption, which is basically the inverse of this, right? We have basically our ciphertext and we're turning it back into plain text. Very simple. Now we have something called the cipher. The cipher is the actual algorithm that encrypts the plain text. Now there are tons of ciphers, tons of them. Um, and I cover quite a few of them within this lecture of how we can encrypt with them, decrypt with them, and of course break them. Um, all of this is done through some sort of mathematical process, but it also uses something called a key. Now, the key is basically a secretive set of characters that we can use for the ciphering process. Um, it kind of works almost as like a password for the cipher, and you'll kind of understand how that kind of goes as we go out through this presentation. So then we have something called encoding. Now, encoding and encryption are similar, but actually very different on some level, right? So encoding is actually a ciphering process, but it doesn't use a key, right? where we have a key in a lot of encryptions, which makes them actually secure. Something like an encoding, if you're familiar with Base64, for example, um, is an encoding, right? You can easily encrypt or encode and decode it. Encode being our way to encrypt that or encrypt that plain text by following the code and decode being our way to decrypt that ciphertext by following that same code. Cool. Very simple. Now we're kind of moving on to more ciphering concepts. Any questions before I continue? Let's keep going. So now we're going to talk about symmetric key encryption. Symmetric key encryption is a ciphering, algo or ciphering algorithm that uses the same key to encrypt and decrypt text, all right? I drew up this little picture for you guys to kind of give you guys a concept or an example of how symmetric key encryption works. We have our plain text, then we use this key to basically turn it into ciphertext through whatever encryption algorithm we decide to use. Um, from this plain text into this ciphertext, we have this key that we use to encrypt. Now, when we turn this ciphertext back into plain text, 
we use the same exact key. So it's the same key that's going in and out of the encryption and decryption process. A kind of an example of this is if you think about a door, right? In order to lock your door or encrypt your door, right? You would have to use the same key you would use to decrypt it. It's the same key to encrypt, decrypt, or unlock and lock your door. So now we're going to introduce the first cipher. This is a very simple and easy to understand cipher, but this cipher will give you more context to understand um, the ciphers as we continue through this presentation, all right? So the Caesar cipher is a symmetric encryption ciphering process, all right? All it does is it works by moving or shifting letters down the alphabet by a certain number. It was named after Julius Caesar, and um, this was like one of the earliest encryptions within our history, right? Julius Caesar did use this encryption as a way to quote unquote, encrypt messages amongst his army and military members, all right? So here's an example of the Caesar cipher. Um, our key is equal to one. And basically all that key is doing is shifting these characters one place down the alphabet, right? So we have our plain text, which is hello. And then each of these characters gets shifted one place down the alphabet. So we have H, the character after H is I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, right? So the plain text or our cipher text would be I. And we repeat this process on all the letters until we have the ciphertext. Now, if our key was two, these characters would be shifted two places down the alphabet, right? It would be H would go to I to J. So H would be J, E would be D, I believe, and so on and so forth. So it's a very simple and easy to understand cipher. Um, within the cipher, we have indexing. And indexing is basically a representation of character placement, right? Saying this is the first letter in the alphabet, this is the second letter in the alphabet, this is the third, and this is the 26th, right? going in that order, right? D would have an index of four, E would have an index of five, and so on. Um, within our cipher text, let's say we have a key of one again, all these characters get shifted one place down the alphabet, right? So B got shifted to the place of one, C got shifted to the place of two, D would have gotten place, shifted to the place of three, and so on. A, that's at the index of one, gets cycled back to index of 26, so we get this as our result. So there is an algorithm behind the Caesar cipher that allows it to be used as a computing process, right? Again, cryptography is just math with extra steps, right? So we have our encryption, right? C is equal to X plus K modulus 26. I'm gonna explain what these characters or these variables mean in a second. However, I just wanna show you that, hey, this modulus basically gets the remainder of, that's all it's doing, right? So when we divide this result X plus K by 26, our result is simply just going to be the remainder of that divided by 26, right? And then our decryption process does the same thing, but instead of adding this X and K value, we're subtracting this X and K value. So as a result, our C is equal to our cipher, our ciphered character, right? So if we're trying to encrypt a character, this would be the resulting character. And for decrypting, this would be our plain text character, right? The X just represents the index of that character, right? Hey, how A has an index of one, B has an index of two and so on. This is that index that we're representing. Then this K value would just be our key, right? The, if we're shifting by a character of one, if we're shifting by two index or indexes, three indexes and so on. So how can we actually implement this into a computer program, right? Well, we do have something called, you know, the program language of Python to actually automate this for us, right? Because no one wants to actually manually have to move these characters. However, Python doesn't actually understand English alphabet indexing, right? It doesn't know that A has an index of one, B has an index of two. You have to create your own sort of dictionaries and account for uppercase and lowercase letters. It just gets very complicated very quickly. So what we can do as a result of this is use something called Unicode. Now Unicode is basically the computer standard when it comes to handling text, all right? Um, each letter is case, uh, case sensitive, so it recognizes capital letters and lowercase letters separately. Um, and each of those characters has an index to actually represent it. So for an example, in Unicode, capital A has an index of 65 and lowercase a has lower, or an index of 97. Shouldn't it be um, X plus K minus 26 plus one if we are indexing from one to 26? Actually, no. Um, so what we are doing is even though it has an index of one, it, doesn't necessarily matter because the character placement is still there. It's more about the order and the resulting characters. And in fact, when we're using Unicode, um, we still are actually accounting for that character shift rather than the actual character indexes that we're going to go through. It'll kind of become more clearness. 
Um, so then we have the 25 indexes after each of the characters that would represent the rest of the alphabet, right? So after the character A and the index of 65, those 20 or those 25 numbers after the number 65 would be the rest of the capital alphabet. And the same thing for our lowercase a. So we can use some Unicode functions to help our code work in Python, right? So we have the order function. The order function basically takes a Unicode character and gives it its Unicode index. For example, if we put the capital A in there, we would get 65 as our result. And our character function does the exact opposite, right? We would just take a um, our 65, for example, right, a Unicode index, and it would give us our Unicode character. It's a very simple concept, right? So when we have these algorithms in Python, we are basically taking, let's say this is our normal encryption algorithm, right? C equals X plus K modulus 26. For uppercase characters, this is what it would look kind of like, right? Our plus equals operator basically just adds on to our plain text variable. And then we are basically getting the order of that letter, right? So that order of the letter is getting the index, right? So now we have the index. Then we're adding the key with that value, right? We're subtracting 65 to remove the Unicode index and bring it back down to the index of one or zero. It doesn't really matter because the what matters is the shift, not necessarily the exact index. However, and then, or I'm sorry, then we, you know, divide by 26, get the remainder, and then we're adding 65 again to bring it back into the range of the Unicode alphabet. So as a result, we'll get a plain text character when we run it through this character function. And then the same thing, just, just apply to lowercase letters, right? So instead of the index of 65, we're using that index of 97. Cool. So of course, our plain text represents our plain text variable. Our letter represents our letter variable and the key would represent the key variable. So this is how we can implement it in Python through the encryption process, right? Now we'll just have to do it with the decryption process. So it's pretty much gonna be the same exact thing, but instead of adding our key to our characters, we're gonna be subtracting it, right? And having those you know, uppercase indexes and those lowercase indexes, and of course, subtracting the key. Our ciphertext would just represent the ciphertext variable and these other two variables will stay the same. So any questions before we move on? So now we're gonna enter the stage of cipher interaction, basically where we are working or interacting with the actual cipher at hand, right? So right now, I'm gonna show you something called the Codex Project. The Codex Project is a Python cryptography suite that I'm actually currently building on my YouTube channel if you were to check it out. Um, but basically, we can use this as a way to explain how we can break these ciphers, right? So here's just a picture of the Codex Project GitHub repository. And to install the codex, we can simply just use git, right? It's hosted on GitHub, and we can use the git clone up or git clone command to basically clone the repository onto our um, Linux distribution, right? Feel free to follow along if you wish to. However, I do have screenshots displaying exactly the process that we're going to be using to encrypt, decrypt, and break the Caesar cipher, right? So. Let's start navigating to the codex, right? We can simply change our directories into the codex project, right? CD into the codex project. And if we were to list, we can see we have a main.py file here. This is the main code for the codex project. Very simple, right? So now we can actually use Python to run the codex. So we can simply run Python 3 on our main.py file and it will run the codex project for us. Cool. So when it comes to our Caesar ciphering options, we can simply check out, hey, what options do we actually have in here to encrypt, decrypt, and break the Caesar cipher, right? So we have a tax C for our Caesar cipher. So we can simply use the tax C as our first argument on the Caesar cipher. Then we have a tax E to encrypt, D to decrypt, B to brute force. Then we can actually add use a tax K to add our key and our T to add text to our cipher, right? Basically the text we want to encrypt, decrypt, or break. Um, there's also a tag i argument if you want to input a file that has longer sets of text. However, we're not going to be doing that for this example. Cool. So let's actually encrypt with the Caesar cipher. We can encrypt the word hello with the key of five. So this is what this would look like, right? We have our Python 3 on our main.py file, 
We're using the tag C as our Caesar cipher, the tag E to encrypt, the tag T for our text, and the text hello is what we're going to encrypt, right? And then the tag K of five, and we get MJQQT as a result. So we can see that we got that as our you know cipher text. And we can do the same thing on our MJQQT, which is our cipher text, and basically decrypt it with that key of five. We run it through, running that Python 3 manda pi. We're using the Caesar cipher. This time we're using the tag D to decrypt our text of MJQQT with the key of five. And as a result, we get hello. So that's the basic process of encryption and decryption with the Caesar cipher, right? Now, how do we break ciphers, right? This presentation is, of course, teaching you cryptography. It's teaching you how we can encrypt. It's teaching you how we can decrypt. But a very important concept of cryptography, at least in the security world, is breaking ciphers. Breaking ciphers, right? Let's use this example. In the real world, we have keys that can unlock and lock doors, right? When you get home, you can lock it. Or when you're getting home, you can unlock the door. When you're leaving for work or wherever, you would lock the door. In the world of cryptography, our keys encrypt and decrypt text, right? So if we look at our real world example, we can pick the lock, right? If so, someone were to enter your home, they would pick the lock to your door to enter your home and to you know, break into your home and do whatever they needed to do. Um, hackers in the security world are picking these locks of encryption and decryption. So how can we as security professionals understand how we can do that in order to, I guess, secure these communications, right? So. How do we break the Caesar cipher? Well, realistically speaking, as security professionals, we actually don't know the key that the Caesar cipher is using, right? It can be using any number of keys, right? Or whatever key number that it is using, right? We can't decrypt the Caesar cipher if we don't know the key. So it's not like we could just try every key possible, right? Well, actually, right? What is the concept of brute forcing? Because the brute force attack is basically a hacking method where a hacker tries every possible combination to gain access into a system, right? I'm sure you guys are familiar with brute forcing already, but um, when it comes to the Caesar cipher, there's something really interesting about it, right? Now, we don't want to mainly run this script 20 or a bunch of times to basically um, decrypt it with any key possible. So we can simply just use Python as a process to, you know, brute force it for us, right? When it comes to breaking the Caesar cipher, there's something very important we need to understand, right? Let's say if our key is 24, basically each character in our alphabet shifted over 24 characters, right? This is what our indexing would look like. The letter Y would be in the index of one, Z would be in the index of two, A would be in the index three, and all the way down with X be the index of 26. So let's say we're using a key of 25. So our key of 25, these characters shift down one more time, right? So Z is now in the index of one, A is now in the index of two, B is now in the index of three, C would be in index four, all the way to Y, shifting down from index one back to 26. So Y would be now in 26. So now let's use the key of 26. Well, now our characters shift over again, right? A gets shifted over to index of one, B gets shifted over into the index of two, C in the index of three, and Z, which was index one, now goes back to the index of 26. I don't know if you guys caught that, but with a key of 26, this is what our indexing looks like. Right? A is in index one, B is in index two, C is in index three, and Z is in the index of 26. But with a key of zero, which is the standard index for, you know, the standard plain text indexing without encryption, we have the same exact, or I guess same, same exact, you know, indexing chart for our cipher, right? So with a key of zero and a key of 26, we get the same exact result because all the keys have already or cycled all the way through the alphabet. So this means that the Caesar cipher only has 26 possible keys. Because if we were to shift it over again, it would just be the exact same result as a shift of one. So a shift of 27 is the same exact thing as a shift of one. So there's only 26 possible keys we can use in the Caesar cipher. So we can just simply brute force the cipher with a key of one, a key of two, three, four, all the way to 26, right? So the Codex project already does this for us, right? So let's take our MGQQT and we're pretending we don't know the key. We already know the key is five because I used this example already. However, if we didn't know and we ran it through the Caesar cipher, 
we're running our Python 3 main.py file. The tag C is the Caesar cipher. The tag B is the brute force option that I was talking about earlier. And we're using it on the tag T or our text of MJQQT. When we run this, it's going to try a key of zero, one, two, three, and four, and it's going to try a key of six and seven. But you see, when we try the key of five, we get our plain text of hello, right? So there's only 26 possible keys. So this is something very easy that we can brute force on a lower level encryption on like something like MJQQT, which is pretty cool. So we just broke our first cipher, right? Instead of trying to figure out what key they were using or to find out some alternative way, we can simply just brute force the cipher using all 26 possible keys, right? This is what I'm talking about breaking ciphers, right? Cryptography is very faulty. Um, math is very faulty. So when it comes to the ciphers that are built off of mathematical problems, we can simply just use the faults within that math as a way to decrypt the cipher. So now we're going to get into more so breaking ciphers is brute forcing? No. So there's actually, sir, there is brute forcing for the Caesar cipher. And as we move on, there's another brute forcing example. But we're going to dive into concepts like letter frequencies, word, cryptographic word listing. Um, and as we get over, or as we go through it, you'll kind of understand it a little bit more and more. So cryptographic word listing, right? It's similar to the concept of brute forcing, right? Brute forcing is a great concept for lower level cryptographic attacks. Um, but if we had several documents, right? Because we can actually attach documents to something like the codex, right? If we had several documents that were all encrypted in the Caesar cipher, sure, it could encrypt it, you know, or decrypt it 26 times, but that's several documents for encrypting 26 different times. And we have to mainly check each of those documents to see, hey, if one of those is correct, just to find the key, right? It also may take a lot of time. It's a lot of processing power. Um, so it's not always the most efficient thing to do, right? This comes to the concept of cryptographic word listing or a dictionary attack, right? A dictionary attack is a type of brute force, but we can iterate through a dictionary of possible combinations, right? So instead of trying every possible combination, we can just try the most likely combinations, right? So this dictionary that we're going to iterate through is something called a word list. I'm sure you guys are familiar with what a word list is. However, um, as we get into the more complex, more advanced examples, knowing these fundamentals will be very helpful, right? So if we look at the Caesar cipher, right, we have a word listing option right here, or right here, right, or tag R. Attack R basically allows us to choose a range of keys that we can start and end the brute force with, right? Let's go ahead and try cryptographic word listing, right? So let's use our same example of MJQQT. We already know it has a key of five, but let's say for example, we know that their key is going to be ranging from one through 10, right? So we can kind of shorten down the time this or this time the attack will take and kind of save ourselves on computer power, processing, et cetera. When we do this, right, we're basically having this command being run, right? We're running our Python 3 on our main.py and tag here, we're brute forcing with the range of one through 10 on that plain or on that ciphertext of MJQQT. As a result, we get our key of five, right? Hello, right? It's right here. Same exact thing, just less time, more efficient, and um, more practical, right? So this kind of introduces the importance of efficiency, right? We just broke a new cipher, so congratulations. But the first time we used something, something, or we used something that was less efficient, right? But we're forcing is very practical. However, it can take time, processing power, and the more complex the cipher is, the longer it's going to take. So it isn't always the most efficient. However, if we have a word list of more of like the most likely keys or the most likely passwords we may be brute forcing against, um, it's going to be a little bit more practical, right? So cryptography, uh, cryptography requires us to kind of really think about how we're going to be attacking a certain system or a process, um, kind of decide what is best for the process. All right. So now this is going to be introducing a new cipher. Right, we're going to move into more advanced ciphers as we go. Uh, the Visionaire cipher is actually my personal favorite cipher, um, simply because the cool stuff you can actually do around it. Right, so it was invented by Giovanni Bellasso in 5053. Right, so we can see that we had um, encryption all the way in you know the times of Julius Caesar, and we now we're moving into kind of more medieval types of times. Right, um, it was revised or published by um, Visionaire. And 
This is what we call it because of the more advanced version that he developed. It's also referred to as the polyalphabetic cipher, um, but either way, it's still the same cipher, right? So now let's talk about visionary indexing, right? We're gonna be using the index of zero within our visionary cipher because that's how it is kind of structured, right? The indexing within the Caesar cipher isn't also. Playfair cipher is also cool in some of the visionary, it is, yeah. Um, so within our visionary cipher, we have an index of zero. Cipher or the Caesar cipher, the indexing isn't as important. What matters is the order of the alphabet and the shift. When it comes to the visionary cipher, the indexing is very important, right? So we have an index of our letter A, which is zero, and the index of our letter M, which is, or letter Z, which is 25, right? So now we're going to select our key in plain text. For this example, I'm going to be using the word key as our key just to make it kind of easier to understand. And each character again has their or their um, index, right? The letter K has an index of 10, the letter E has an index of four, and the letter Y has an index of 24. Now, when we go to use our plain text, right? We have our plain text right here, which is the word encrypt. And each of these characters have their index on that alphabet, right? This is super important and super fundamental to the visionary cipher and ways of how we can actually break it, right? So. Before we can actually break it, let's learn how we can encrypt and decrypt with it, right? Encrypting the visionary cipher is this process right here. We have our plain text, right? The word encrypt. What we do is we get the indexes of our plain text, right? E has an index of four, N has an index of 13, C has an index of two and so on. What we're doing is we're taking our key, right? K, E, Y, these are the indexes of our key, just repeating over and over again until it fulfills our plain text, right? And what we're gonna do is in order to encrypt it, we're basically gonna add these values to these indexes, right? So we're adding this index to this index, this index to this index and so on. And these are the results that we're gonna get. These results are going to become our ciphertext indexes. So what we do is we're searching through that index chart and see, hey, what character has an index of 14? Well, the character O does. All right, what character has an index of 17? R does. And when we do that, we get our ciphertext right here. All right, very simple. Again, this is just the key cycling over and over again, right? In order to decrypt it, we basically run the same operation, but instead of adding, we're decrypting and start starting, instead of starting with our plain text, we're starting with our ciphertext, right? So we have our ciphertext, O-R-A, whatever, and we're getting those indexes of each of those characters. What we do after that is we're sub basically subtracting our key in that same cycling order and as a result, we get these as our plain text indexes. And then from there, we can basically get those indexes and match them to the characters. And as a result, we get our word encrypt again. So that is the visionary cipher in a nutshell, right? Now, there's two ways I'm gonna show how we can break the visionary cipher. First, we're gonna finish talking about the whole concept of word listing, right? Again, if we say, or we see that, um, we have a file from the company of Cosmodium CS that is encrypted in Visionaire. We can basically create a targeted word list on the Cosmodium CS company with a tool called Cool. Um, cool basically creates word lists based off contents off of these websites, and we can use it to create a word list against our Visionaire cipher, right? So Cool has some arguments, right? D basically goes how many pages deep on the website we want to search for certain words that may serve as a key. Um, Tag M is basically the minimum length for those passwords we were trying, or the keys we may be trying to generate. Um, our tag W will work as our output file, and we can simply run this on our um, Linux terminal to get this word list, right? We can see we're running the word or the tool cool. The tag D basically goes three pages deep. Tag M with a minimum password length of six, or key length in this case. And our, we're saving all these contents to a word list.lst. Um, in the security world, you're actually supposed to save word list as a .lst file instead of a .txt file, simply to differentiate them from anything else. Um, and then as a result, we have our website that we're targeting, which is cosmodiumcs.com. So as a result, when we list our file contents, we get that word list, that .lst file. Cool. So if we examine our word list, right, cat basically will cat out or basically read out the file contents, the tag end basically displays the file numbers, right? Or the number lines of the file, right? 
we can see that we're getting specific words from our you know website that we can totally iterate through this list and use these as the keys to our visionaire cipher, right? So instead of using KEY, because there are no companies actually going to use the visionaire cipher, or in that case, use the word key as the key. Um, however, we can use these as the key, right? We can just iterate through these words and try them on our visionaire cipher. Um, again, attack N attribute just displays the um, numbers. So this word list generated 1,700 possible keys for our cipher text. Excuse me. So codex implementation, right? Our codex does not or is not yet capable of doing visionary word listing. However, you can easily build your own Python script or bash script where you basically are just cycling through the word list and then running the codex project with that key. All right. Any questions before we move on to letter frequencies? I see somebody typing, so I'll give them a chance. Awesome. All right, cool. So now let's talk about letter frequencies, right? We kind of covered the concept of brute forcing. Now we're going to move out of that concept and into some more advanced level cryptographic breaking, right? So, so we are not sure if any of these keys work. Oh, no, for totally. Um, Hacking in cryptography is a very, you know, trial and error game, right? When we're talking about the world of cryptography and we're trying to decrypt a file like this, none of those keys may work, right? But if we're decrypting a file, we can use letter frequencies as our alternative option. I'll actually show you how we can do this, right? So when we're breaking the Visionaire cipher, we can actually decrypt ciphers like the Visionaire cipher um, without the key. We don't need the key because um, we can simply just discover the key, all right? And Basically, the mathematical process behind the Visionaire cipher is flawed, just like all these other ciphers, right? Um, we need two steps in order to be able to discover the key. We need to find out what length the key is, and we need to find out the key indexes, right? And we can simply get both of this, um, both of these sets of information off of just looking at the cipher text, which is pretty cool. So first of all, we need to cover something called coincidences. Coincidences are basically how we can discover key lengths um within our plain text it's basically like when we can shift over actually let me slow down for a second right if we take our cipher text and if we shift it on itself over and over and over again and i'll show you what that looks like we can discover letters that commonly appear on the same indexes and with this process we can determine the key length all right so let's say this is our cipher text right however in the world of decrypting or breaking the visionaire cipher, you would need a cipher that is much longer than this, right? Um, but if we were to use this as our cipher text, we can basically take our cipher text, which is right here, right? And we're basically going to take the same cipher text and shift it over on itself over and over and over again. Now you basically want to do this on the entire process of the cipher text, but basically what we can see are these coincidences, right? If we look in our cipher text and then look at all the or all the letters that appear over and over again within the same column, we can mark them down to get the, or to discover the key length, right? For example, we have our cipher text here. Then if we shift it on itself one time, we can see that the letter C appears in the same index and the letter C appears in the same index here. So we have two coincidences. Now we repeat this process over and over again, right? We shift our cipher text one more and we're matching our first original ciphertext to this new shifted one. And we look and we see, hey, the letter N appears twice. All right, now we're gonna shift over again and match this original ciphertext with the new shifted ciphertext. And we're basically gonna repeat this process until we mark down all these coincidences, right? So we can see that, you'll understand why these two twos are highlighted, but we can see that, hey, these are all the co so coincidences within this ciphertext, right? So if we look at our coincidences, we can see the greatest value numbers, which are highlighted in yellow, um, that appear within our separate text basically determine the length of our key. So we can see that this two, if we count 
one, two, three, four is when the next highest number is hit. Therefore, our key length is four. So now we know the key length, right? The bigger the text, obviously, the more coincidences we'll find and the more accurate our key will be. But looking at this, we can see, hey, the most likely key that our, our ciphertext is using is a key of four, right? It iterates four pl places before it hits the next highest number. Now, realistically speaking, right, your ciphertext is going to be much larger than this. Um, but when we use this process on it, you're going to see numbers like 50, and then it's going to hit like 10, and then it's going to go up to like 70, and it's going to hit like 10 or whatever. And you'll see those greater, larger numbers that stand out are going to determine your key length, all right? So now we know the key length is four. So now what we need to do is find the key indexes, right? So let's take our ciphertext and we're going to mark every fourth character because our key is four. If it had the key of five, we're going to mark every fifth character. If it had the key of six, you would mark every sixth character, right? But we're going to do this starting from the first index. Now, again, your ciphertext is going to be much larger than this. So I have the three dots there to represent the rest of the ciphertext. But basically, we're going to take this letter C and then go to the next time that key placement would be there, right? So we're going to shift over four. So one, two, three, four. And then we're going to highlight our V. And then four characters, T. And you're going to do this down the rest of your ciphertext until you hit every fourth character. Um, the reason we're doing this is because the um, the Visionaire cipher, if we had a key of four and the first letter of our key is A, for example, the A would be here, then it would cycle, and then the A would be here. So we're basically discovering what key index that is representing, all right? So let's actually try to discover these key indexes, right? So now that we counted every time, um, every fourth character, we need to count every time a specific character appears within every fourth character. So when we do this, right, we're just going to be using all this slice of our ciphertext. We see that we have the letter C, V, T, and N. Let's say, for example, our letter C appears 15 times. The letter V, the letter v appears 25 times. The letter T appears 75 times. And the letter N appears 10 times. As a total, there's 100 characters. I only did this to make the math easier, but realistically speaking, you're going to have um, various ranges of characters going down the ciphertext, right? So we can now find the frequencies, all right? The frequencies are basically how common each letter appears within a set of text. So our frequency is basically equal to the appearance um, divided by the total. The appearance is basically how many times it appeared within every fourth character, right? Or every fourth um, character within our ciphertext. So we have our C, V, T, and N, right? The C appears 15 times. So what we're doing is taking our 15, dividing it by 100, and our frequency is 0 0.15. All right, and we basically are repeating this process until we get the frequencies of all the other characters. So basically, the letter C has a 15% chance of appearing within our ciphertext of those iterated four characters, of course. That's basically what the frequencies are doing. So now that we have these frequencies of our ciphertext, we can actually use those to get the um, indexes within our ciphertext. Now, before we can do that, we need to look at the actual frequencies for this letter, right? So we know the ciphertext frequency for the letter C is 15%. But in the English, you know, alphabet, the cipher or the frequency for the letter C in general text is 0 0.02782, um, as you can see here. So basically, these are all the frequencies for the letters. I just included them in here for if you ever wanted to try and do the math by yourself. Of course, we're going to automate this with Python so that way we don't have to do all this annoying math. However, um, we can see that these are the English letter frequencies that exist within our alphabet. You can clearly see that the letter E is the most common letter because it has the highest frequency. Little fun fact. Um, so now we can actually use this chart and discover our indexes, right? So what we're gonna do is sort the ciphertext characters in alphabetical order. So even though we have like C, V, T, and N, we're gonna rearrange those characters in alphabetical order, all right? What we're going to do is get the ciphertext frequency, like as we showed you, which was what, 15% for the letter C. Then we're going to get the alphabet frequency, which was like 0 0.07 or 2, something like that. And then we're going to multiply the frequencies together, which we call the product. And then we add those totals together. Now, you might be a little lost, but I'm going to show you guys exactly how this works, right? So we have our cryptographic breaking process. 
Um, I know that looks like a lot, but I'm basically going to follow you through, right? We have our letter C. The English frequency was 0 0.2782, right? So this is how common the letter is within the English alphabet, generally speaking. Then we have the frequency of our letter, which is 0.15. Um, this was, you know, how common it was within that ciphertext every fourth character. What we're going to do is basically multiply these two values together, and we get this as a result. Now, we basically just repeat this process for the, all the other characters, right? N, we get its um, you know, English frequency, we get the ciphertext frequency, multiply them together, and this is the result, all the way down. Then all we do is add these values together in orange, and this is the sum. So this is the frequency that, or like that final frequency that we're going to get. And we can see this has a shift to zero, so all these characters are in order. What we do from here is we just shift these frequencies over until they all go through a full cycle, right? So our 0.15 that was originally under C gets shifted one place under the letter V. These English frequencies stay the same, but the ciphertext frequencies get shifted. So we shift these frequencies by one place. We basically multiply these together, get this value, add all this, um, or add all the products together, and we get the sum of this frequency. Now we just basically repeat this process again, right? With the shift to two and the shift to three until we hit all of those, until we do one full cycle, right? Uh, I'm basically just showing you this is the sum that we get again, and this is the sum that we get again. I did all this math um, just to show you guys how we can use this um, on the Visionaire Cipher. So now let's examine our products. We did all of our math, and we basically are looking for the shift that has the highest frequency, all right? Now, again, realistically speaking, if I go back, um, you're going to have a lot more characters in this. You're going to have C, N, T, V, A, B, whatever. You're basically going to have the whole alphabet. So you're going to be shifting more than three times. You're going to be shifting at least 26 times um, to get the full level of possible sums, right? Now, when we examine all of those you know, sums together, we have to see which one has the highest frequency. We can see that the 0 0.08 has the highest frequency, so the first index of our four-letter key is the letter A because the letter A is in index zero. That's the process. So now we have the letter A as the first character within our key. So all we have to do is basically we just repeat this mathematical process, but this time instead of getting every fourth character starting from the first character, you would get every fourth character starting from the second, the third, and then the fourth until you, you'll have to, of course, break before this because you have every character now. So all you do is just repeat this mathematical process X amount of times. Let's say it's four times. So it would be four, you would repeat this mathematical process four times. And when you finish that, you will have the index of the first character, the second character, the third character, and the fourth character. That's how we got the key. So all we have to do from here is just decrypt it because we would have discovered the key. Now I'm not going to show this visually because that's just a lot of math. And we can actually automate this process for us using Python, right? The Codex project has already implemented this. I did implement it on live stream um, on the YouTube channel. But basically, we can just, of course, you know, how I say this, um, automate the process, right? So if you don't know what lorem ipsum is, it's basically just placeholder text. I've just put about 885 characters worth of placeholder text within this file, right? If I cut it out, you can see that I have, whoops, you can see that I have this lorem ipsum.txt file here. If we cut it out, you can see that there is just random placeholder text within this file. What we're going to do is encrypt this file, right? We can encrypt the file based basically using our Python main.py. We're going to use the tac v, which is the option for the Visionaire Cypher, the tac e to encrypt it. We're using the key of hello. And then our tac i is basically going to encrypt our lorem ipsum.txt and output it to this encrypted.txt file. All right, so now we have, if we of course cut out the file, right? We can see that we have our encrypted lorem ipsum placeholder text. Um, very simple, right? Now, what we're gonna do is instead of decrypting it, because we don't know what the key is, right? When we encrypted it previously, you can see that we used a key of hello, right? So that should be our result. However, as the hacker, you won't know what key that they used. Right, and you could of course brute force it with some sort of word list, but if the word hello isn't in there, then you won't be able to decrypt it as one of you guys mentioned in the chat, right? So what we have are our visionary breaking options within the Caesar cipher, right? 
If you check out if the options for the Visionaire Cipher by simply running the tag V, we can see that we have this tag U, which basically decrypts it with an unknown key. That is basically just using letter frequencies as I showed you guys previously. So what we can do is get the Visionaire letter frequencies through the Codex project. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna run it, right? We're using that tag U and we're running it on our encrypted text. And what it does is it gets the most probable key length, which is 15 is in the size, and it gets the key, hello, hello, hello. Now this is completely accurate because Visionaire Cipher, the key repeats. So even if our key is hello, 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 hello is still an accurate key within our cipher. And it got the cipher just by using letter frequencies. So instead of you know trying to dictionary attack or cryptographic word listing, we can use the faults of the math behind the cipher to just figure out what the key is and decrypt it. So any questions before I move on? I know there was a lot of math and such behind it, so. So if the Visionaire cipher would make use of different order of the alphabet, would the cipher breaking process still work? Mm, kind of. Um, so with letter frequencies, we're trying to see how common each letter is. Um, it would not necessarily vary because we're matching it to the um, order of the actual alphabet, right? When we're ordering it, because what we had to do with the um, better frequency breaking is that we put the characters in alphabetical order regardless, right? If they're using a different alphabet, it it could still work. Um, it's not promised, but it is likely that we could get a um, result. The only thing that would kind of just differentiate that is if, um, I guess the difference in indexes, but um, it should still be able to work, yeah. So I wanted to ask about English frequencies. Where did it come from? Yeah, so English frequencies are basically how common each letter is, generally speaking. If we took every document that people wrote in the, like let's say this past year, um, and just got the probabilities of those characters on how common each character was used, that's basically the frequencies, right? So the English frequencies are how common each of those characters are used in the English language. So what we're using is basically saying how all this is based on probability, right? What we're doing with letter frequencies is the pro the guarantee the result isn't guaranteed, but it's very likely. I would say like it's ninety five percent accurate, um, because what we're doing is basically using the probability of what they're writing on compared to what the national average of those characters are. Um, so it's basically just probability math, but 95% of the time, you will get the correct key. Um, so that's where it came from. Any other questions before we move on? Cool. All right. So let's move on into cryptographic structure, right? How does cryptography actually work outside of the concept of, you know, the Caesar cipher and the visionary cipher, right? Um, well, we as humans rely on a decimal numeric system, right? To count and do mathematical equations, right? Um, the decimal system is base 10 and it's composed of nine digits ranging from zero to nine. Um, so it's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? Any number within um, our, I guess, decimal numeric system is composed of these numbers, right? If we have the number 12, it is composed of a one and a two, right? Um, that's the decimal numeric system. I'm sure all you guys are familiar with that. Um, however, computers rely on completely numerical systems, right? They use um, hex and binary, but we're going to be focusing on binary for this example. So what is binary? Like what actually is binary, right? Binary is a base two numeric system. Um, it is composed of two digits, one representing on or true and two or zero representing off or false. Remember these true and false values, this will come very important as we are going to be breaking ciphers later in this lecture, right? Um, our, one binary bi our one binary number is one byte. It's one byte of data. And each number within it is composed of eight bits, right? 
to give me an example, this is what a binary number looks like. And this is what our decimal number looks like. Our decimal number 28 in binary looks like this. How do we get there, right? Well, first of all, just to clarify, right, this whole thing is one byte of data and each of these individual digits is a bit, all right? Just to kind of put that emphasis out there when I'm talking about stream ciphers and such, um, this is what it is composed of. So to go from decimal to binary, we basically take our number 28, for example, and each bit within that, or which in each bit within the byte has a value. And that value is basically um, the value of an exponent of two ranging from zero to seven. Let me kind of clarify this, right? Let's say this is our binary number, right? Each of these bits has a value of two to the seventh, two to the sixth, two to the fifth, right? Two with an exponent ranging from zero to seven. So two to the seventh all the way down to two to the zero. Our value is basically just the value of that exponential math, right? So two to the seventh is 128, two to the sixth is the six, or 64, two to the fifth is 32 and so on. Right, so that's what each of these um, bits have a value of. When we're taking our value of 28, what we're basically doing is finding the first value that can go into our decimal number, right? The, basically the largest value that can go into our decimal number. 128 cannot go into 28 because it is greater than 128, but 16 can go into 128. So what we do is we're basically marking a one in that bit section. If it can't go into there, we're going to mark it with a zero, right? 128 can't go into 28, so we mark it with a zero, mark it with a zero, mark it with a zero, because 32 can't go into 128, but 16 can. So we'll mark it with a one, because it, it's true, right? It can go into that value of 128. What we're going to do from here is basically subtract that value, right? We're subtracting 16 from our 128, and we get that value of 12. Then we're basically repeating this process, right? And this time when we repeat the process, we're using this new decimal value as the value that we're going to be converting, right? So we go from 12, then we take our eight and we subtract. We know this, Chris, you can skip over conversions between systems. Okay, cool. Uh, so what we do now is we take our new decimal value, which is 12, and we basically see what the next greatest value that can go into the number. So that would be eight, right? Eight is the largest value that we now have um, that can go into eight. So we mark it with the one, subtract, and we get four. And now we would look again, repeat this process, say what's the greatest value that can go into the number four it is currently the number four. So hey, four goes into four, we'll mark it with a one, subtract it and we have zero. So as a result, our, bin our original decimal number 28 turns into this binary number of 00011100. So how do we go from binary back to decimal? Well, we have our binary number, which is 01011010. Very simple binary number. At first glance, you may not understand what this number represents. So let's use binary to decimal conversion to uh, be better able to understand what it represents. So we can simply just add the values um, that is represented by each binary one. So if we look at our chart, we can see that we have this binary number. And again, each binary bit has a value that represents it, right? This bit has a value of 128, this bit has a value of 64, this bit has a value of 32, and so on. So what we can do is find every true value, right, where there's a one, so 64, 16, eight, and two, and we can simply just add these values together. So we will add our 64, we'll add our 16, we'll add our eight, and we'll add our two, right, because that's the values that are represented under each of these values. Add that together and we get 90. So our decimal number 90 whoops, is our the same thing as this binary number. So that's how we can do simple binary to decimal conversion. Um, so now we're going to talk about block ciphers, right? So when we encrypt and um, when we are encrypting with the previous ciphers, right, the Caesar cipher and the Visionaire cipher, we can clearly see that, hey, this is not enough. So what we are doing now or what we have is something called stream ciphers or block ciphers and these basically encrypt in sets of bits rather than in sets of the text characters right so each of these ciphers encrypts in something called rounds or blocks or i'm sorry they encrypt um blocks of bits in multiple times and these multiple times we'll call rounds so this is where we're entering aes aes is basically the advanced encryption standard um, in the world of cryptography, right? 
It is currently the only publicly available ciphering method that is used by the US government. Um, it is allowed for the encrypting of classified data, which is pretty cool. Um, it was originally pronounced or called Regendale. I believe that's how you pronounce that. I could be mispronouncing it. Um, but how AES works is that is again, a symmetric block cipher um, that encrypts or decrypts blocks of data, but in 128 bits, right? Now, the keys that we use for AES are sized at 128 bits, 192 bits, and 256 bits. Um, the encryption or rounds depend on the key size, right? So if we're using a 128-bit key, we would be encrypting that set of bits 10 times, right? If we are using a 192-bit key, then we'll be doing it 12 times, and a 256-bit key, we'll be using 14 times, all right? So what is a padding, right? So if our plain text, for whatever example, uses 150 sit or 150 bits, um, after we encrypt our first block of 128 bits, um, there will only be about 22 bits left to encrypt. Um, so for example, if we have 150 bits, the first round is 100, or the first block is 128. So when we finish that first round or first block of encryption, we only have 22 bits left to encrypt. So the cipher needs a hundred, another 106 bits, right? Because there needs to be another block of 128 bits to encrypt. But if we only have 22 bits left, we need to add placeholder data to reach that quota of 128 bits. So what we end up doing is by, we basically the cipher will add placeholder data and that placeholder data is often represented by a double equal sign. So when you're looking at base 64, when you're looking at um, AES, RSA, whatever, um, you'll often see a double equal signs. This basically represents, hey, that data did not meet hit that quota of 100 or 128 bits. So we had to put that placeholder information there. Cool. Base64, I'm sure you guys are already familiar with Base64. It is just a ciphering process that uses um, binary data to encode text, right? Um, it is composed of six bits rather than eight bits. Um, so basically every four Base64 digits would represent three binary bytes, all right? Um, so you'll often see paddings within base64, right? If we have something like Hello World, um, you'll see that double equal sign padding already there. Um, I'm going to kind of go through this a little quicker because I'm sure you guys are already familiar with base64, right? It is um, basically has its own, this has its own shape uh, or its own table, right? It is an encoding rather than encryption, so it doesn't have a key. Um, the reason why I'm covering base or base64 is very important because I'm going to be covering um, the Zor cipher in a second. But however, if we look at each binary number, right, it has a case sensitive index, right? Capital A's uh, through lowercase characters and then the numbers and symbols all have their own index, right? This is part of something called ASCII. ASCII is basically the American standard code for information interchange. It's a super long acronym, which is why we just call it ASCII. Um, ASCII basically serves as the national standard for encoding processes, at least here in America, right? Um, so now I'm gonna be talking about plain text formatting, but before I do, are there any questions about the information I just covered? All right, so now let's talk about plain text formatting, right? Plain text formatting is another way of how we can break certain ciphers, right? So if you are a programmer, if you used programming languages before, I'm sure you are familiar with something called Boolean values. Boolean values basically allow computer programs to run on or run based on certain conditions, right? Um, so we have a true value, which um, exists when the value is true and correct, right? This is a represented with a one. And false is basically when that value doesn't exist and is wrong, and we can represent that with a zero. Remember earlier when I was talking about binary code and how true values or one is basically a value if that value is like on or true and false is off or false. Um, this is that same exact implementation here. And this is gonna become very important as we're diving into other ciphers. Um, so when we talk about Boolean logic, um, Boolean logic basically just allows code to run if multiple conditions are true. Right. So, for example, if we look at um, these operators, for example, right? So they have different operators that they can, or Boolean code has different operators that it can use 
um, to basically implement logic into the code. So we have operators like and, or, not, in, and, x, o, r. And I'll kind of go over all of these in a second. This is highlighted for a reason, but you will see why in a little bit. So we have something like the and operator. The and operator basically takes two arguments, and if both are true, it will return as true, right? So we have two true values, right? So if this is true and this is true, we basically say, hey, this value is true. If one is true and one is false, it's going to return false because both aren't true. And the same thing occurs if false and false. Neither of these values are true, so it will return as false. Um, now we enter something called the OR operator, right? The OR operator basically sees if one argument is true or both our arguments are true, right? So you can see both arguments here are true. So we can return, hey, this is true. When we're looking at something that's true or false, we're saying, hey, this value is true. So this is still true because at least one of these values is true. But again, false or false, we know that this value is false because neither one of these values are true. Now we enter the ZOR operator, which stands for exclusive OR. Um, the ZOR operator is basically checking to see if one is true and one is false. Right? If we look at this, if we have true ZOR true, we're basically saying our is it's exclusively OR, right? It's basically exclusively saying if one of these is true and one of these is false. So because one of these aren't are one of these aren't false, this will return as false. One of these is true, one of these is false, so it will return as true, and neither are true, and neither are, or both of them are false, therefore it will return as false. Um, this concept is implemented into a cipher called the ZOR cipher. And the ZOR cipher basically uses that ZOR operator to encrypt and decrypt text. Um, all we need is at least one byte of data to serve as our key. You can use multiple bytes, but however, um, that one byte of data um, is kind of implemented as your key. So for this example, we're going to be using 01010101 just to make it easy to understand and identify the key. So each character in our plain text has a binary value. For example, if we're using the plain text Cosmo, um, we can see that each of these has that binary value that is associated with ASCII or um, Base64, right? So when we run it through a, whoops, excuse me. When we run it through the actual encryption process, we are basically iterating through each key and each plain text character and seeing if we can run a SOAR operation on it and returning those outputted values, right? So if one of these values is true and the other is false, we'll basically put a one in that placement. Otherwise, it will be a zero, right? Because the answer is false. So if we look at this table, right, we have our letter C, which is the first letter in our plain text for Cosmo, right? This is the binary, um, or this at least the ASCII representation or the binary representation of that letter C. What we're doing is basically taking our key of 01010101 and matching each character to see if it can pass a ZOR operation. So we're looking at zero and zero, which is false and false. So this returns false. So we put that zero there. This is true and true. So we put that zero there because both values are true. But when we get to something like zero and one, whoops, we can see that, hey, one of these is false. One of these is true. That exclusive OR operator will return as a one. And then we repeat this process going down until we have our ciphered binary character. Now, this is an actual representation in ASCII if you wanted to um, have the ASCII represented as actual characters. However, we'll keep it in binary for the sake of this example. Um, when it comes to decrypting with our Zora cipher, it's basically the exact same process, except we iterate through the ciphertext and key and we'll run that um, Zora operation on it, right? So if we look, we have our ciphertext, which is 00010110, and we have our key, which is 01010101. And we're basically just repeating that Zora operation on each of these characters, right? So zero and zero, we know that these are two falses, so it won't pass the Zora operation. So we put that zero there, but we have a false value and a true value. And because it passed as true, we represent that value with the one. And we basically repeat this process. And now we get our 01000011 C character back, right? So that's how we can basically encrypt and decrypt with the Zora cipher. Um, however, we can also do a level of key discovery on our source cipher again. So if we know part of our plain text, just a part of it, if we know, let's say if they're encrypting their username with the password, um, if we know a single, at least one, the first character of our cipher text or of the plain text, 
we can actually discover the key, which is really interesting. So let's say we put our plain text in our ciphertext, right? If we run a Zor operation on the plain text and on the ciphertext, we get the key of 01010101 and that first character of Z or of C. So if you know that the person's password is starts with PAS or it starts with the letter P, for example, you could easily implement this concept and discover the key. Um, it's pretty cool. So the more characters you know, obviously, the more accurate your key is going to be. But if you know simply something simple as the first character, you have a likelihood of getting the password, right? If their password is encrypted with something like, let's see, the first three characters are, you know, PAS. If you were to run this through a Python script, decrypt with the source cipher filtering for PAS, you would get their decrypt, like you will get their password. And I've done it before on my YouTube channel, um, but for the sake of time, I decided to leave that part out. So now we're gonna talk about password hashing. Um, any questions before I move on? I see somebody is typing. All right, no questions? Cool. So we're going to move on into password hashing, all right? So let's talk about the faults of encryption, right? We've looked at encryption so far, at least symmetric encryption. We haven't touched asymmetric encryption yet. However, we can see that this encryptions are flawed, right? The mathematical, uh, mathematical practices behind it are flawed. If we can encrypt something, we can decrypt it. And if we don't know how to decrypt it, we can break it, right? So because of all these faults within these systems, um, hashing algorithms were developed to secure passwords, right? What is a hash? Well, hashing is basically the process of generating ciphertext um, to plain text, right? Or generating um, ciphertext from plain text, right? And we're basically going to use some sort of mathematical function. Something important about hashes is that they can't be decrypted, right? So when it comes to people breaking ciphers, they basically were like, okay, well, we need to make sure that we need to make a system that can't be decrypted, right? So we can't break it, but we can still break hashes. Um, we're just going to be showing you how, right? So when it comes to the world of hashing, again, they're used to secure passwords um, because it can't be decrypted. We can't store documents and such with hashing, right? So when it comes to breaking hashes, let's say we discovered the following hash from a database, right? This, we don't know what hashing algorithm they're using. We don't know any other, really any information about this hash other than the fact that it is a hash that we discovered from a database. The first thing we're, we're gonna do is use something called hash ID. Hash ID is a tool on our security Linux systems that allow us to identify our hash. So we can run hash ID on our hash and as a result, it will display these results. For the example, this is the hash that it's using, um, SHA-256. Um, so what are these hash types, right? If you look back at this, you see all these random hash names. Um, the hash types are basically the different algorithms or the different ciphers um, for hashing in the world of cryptography, right? So the most popular are things like MD5, right? Mes message digest algorithm, which uses 128 bits and the secure hashing algorithm, which is J256, um, of course, using the 256 bit key or represented by the 256 bits, right? Um, our example picked up the secure hashing algorithm 256. So let's actually try to use that to break our hash. So we can actually touch back up on that world of cryptographic word listing, um, but we can use Hashcat to do cryptographic word listing, right? So let's go back to our rocky.txt file, right? We can basically iterate through that file, which is 39 million user credentials, um, and see if any of those would match our hash. Basically, Hashcat is going to hash each of the passwords within our rocky.txt file and basically see if there is a match to the hash that we already have. Um, if any of those match, then we know what the password is. So let's look at our word listing options for Hashcat, right? If we run Hashcat Tatech help within our Linux distributions, you can see that we have attack A argument, which is basically for the attack mode. For this example, we'll be using attack mode zero as the straight normal general Hashcat decryption. Um, we also have attack M. And our attack M is basically for the hash modes. Because we're using J256, we'll be using the option 1400. Cool. 
So when it comes to actually breaking the hash with Hashcat, we have this command right here. What we're doing right there with the attack A0 is we're basically getting the attack mode. And we're getting that attack M1400, and we're basically getting the SHA-256 um, ciphering algorithm on this hash right here, which is our hash. And then finally, we're basically attaching the path to our rockyou.txt file. And there you can see, hey, there's that rockyou.txt word list. So when we run this, as a result, it gets subscribe as our plain text. Of course, I just chose a random word subscribe as plain text, but the word subscribe exists within our rockyou.txt file. So what Hashcat did is it cycled through the rockyou.txt file, hashed each password, and see if any of the hashes matched the hash we have right here. So when Hashcat hashed the word subscribe, it matched the exact same hash of this hash right here. Therefore, the word subscribe is the password. So this will work on any of the passwords within our rockyou.txt database. Um, you can also do hash cracking, which is a whole new level of things and rainbow tables, um, but those are a lot more complex, so I will not be deep diving onto those topics in this lecture. Um, now we have something called salts, right? You can kind of see this common theme of hackers always finding a way to get past it, right? Hackers are always trying to find a way, even if it's the most complex math, like letter frequencies, um, we can still use that kind of concept as a way to kind of bypass um, encryptions and such. So what they did is develop something called salts. Um, these hashes cannot be decrypted due to their complexity. Um, yeah, so basically the hashing algorithm that um, hashes go through um, is a very complex level of math where you can't, I guess, invert the co or the operation that this hashing algorithm is using. So what we have to do as hackers is either crack it, right? Or we're going to be using rainbow tables, which either of which I'm not going to be deep diving, but feel free to deep dive on those topics in your own time. But what we can do is cryptographic word listing, right? We can take a word list like RockQ, which contains some of the most common passwords in the world, hash all of those passwords and see if any of those hashes match, right? Uh, which is pretty cool. But what they decided to do is like, hey, we need to find a way to kind of avoid this process from happening. It's called a one-way function. So it is called a one-way, yeah. Um, so basically, salt is a random string of text that is added to the hash when we hash it, right? So salts can prevent successful dictionary text, um, but they are easily identifiable and Hashcat can actually, our Hashcat does have bypasses for salts. So for example, when we are salting something, we're basically taking that text password and we're adding the salt to it to get the hash, right? So when we have the word hello, for example, and run it through with no salt, this is the hash that we would get right here. But if we have hello, and then we have a salt of 2B05, and we run it through the hashing algorithm, we get a completely different hash. So when we're running something like RockU and hello is in the RockU database, it's going to encrypt it and it's going to, or it's going to run it through the hashing algorithm and it's going to get this as a hash. So when it's matching it to this, it's not actually going to get the actual hash. So what websites have to do, however, or web services or whatever service is hashing passwords is it's going to have to store these hash or these salts, right? It's going to store the hash of the password and the salt. So what we can do is use different ciphering operate or different, um, there was hashing modes, right? Or ciphering modes within Hashcat, the tech M option. There are options where we can attach the salt to the hash and basically Hashcat will run through the rocky.txt database again, but this time it will hash it with that salt that is locally stored within that database. Cool. So any other questions before we start getting into asymmetric encryption? No, um, so you said, but don't we, but we don't know the salt usually, do we? Actually, um, what needs to happen for a website to be able to store the hashes? Is, well, it needs to store the hashes. The hashes are stored with the passwords, um, and we as hackers can use our word list, get the salt, and um, basically run it through the hashing algorithm with Hashcat, right? Basically, you can use like the salt and then a colon, the hash. And then it will use that colon as the identifier to separate the salt from the hash. 
And when you're running it through the hashing algorithm of Hashcat, it's going to basically use or iterate through the word list, rocku.txt file, for example, hash it with those salts and get the return. Um, there is a video um, that I'm going to make and kind of deep diving on this whole concept. But yeah, so salts aren't always the best thing to kind of, they're easily identifiable and they aren't always the most secure. However, it's kind of up to us. We do salt as protection against variable tables. Yeah. Um, so that's what I was kind of talking about before, right? Salt can prevent successful dictionary attacks. Um, but on that same level, it's still not always the greatest thing to use. Um, so now we're entering the world of asymmetric encryption, right? We talked about symmetric encryption where we use the same key to encrypt and decrypt. However, in asymmetric encryption, we're basically, I'm just going to do this, we're talking about asymmetric encryption. Asymmetric encryption is basically where we use a different key to encrypt and decrypt. Um, it is also referred to as public key encryption. This may how you may have heard of it. Um, if there is a salt, is there a pepper as well? <laughs> Unfortunately not, but that would be really cool. Um, the salt, the term salt is actually referring to that um, algorithm being called hashing, like hash browns. So you put salt on your hash browns. That's the reference to um, fun fact. But yeah, so we basically have asymmetric encryption. Asymmetric encryption is a more secure version of symmetric encryption, right? Um, however, it is slower than symmetric key encryption. Um, so it kind of is up to you on to figure out what encryption method is best to use. Um, they are also used together um, in different ways that you will see later in the presentation. Um, but yeah, here's another picture I have drawn up for you guys about asymmetric encryption, right? We have our plain text, then we have a key, and then we have our ciphertext. We're basically running it, we have this encryption key, and this key is basically going to be used to encrypt the cipher. And then we have a separate key that is used to decrypt. These are two different keys. They're two different colors. They're two different mathematical values. Um, they're two different keys. However, the math is cool enough to actually have us be able to encrypt and decrypt with two different keys and still get the same resulting value. All right. To kind of give you a kind of example, right, with symmetric key is kind of like a door where you have one key to unlock and lock it. Asymmetric encryption is kind of like a public mailbox, how people can put mail into it, um, but the only people who can actually unlock it are the people working at the mail service, right? Um, so let's talk about key handling, right? The private key is basically only available to the owner of the encryption, right? And the public key is not actually public. It's more about who um, the key or who the um, whoever the owner shares the key with is basically what the public key is accessible to. It's not like you can just find the key on the internet. I mean, unless if it's a really unsecure cryptography or cryptographic system. Um, so now we're talking about the Duffy Hellman key exchange. Um, it's basically created by Dr. Phil Duffy and um, Dr. Martin Hellman. And um, it basically allows for the generation of asymmetric keys. So this will kind of give you a much deeper understanding on how asymmetric encryption actually works because um, the algorithm works by using these two or two numbers, right? Each number will be used to create a key, either public or private. And one, each number um, has to be greater than, or one of the numbers has to be greater than the other, but both numbers have to be greater than one, right? And I'll kind of give you guys an example of how this is going to work in a second, but just know that the bigger the number, the more secure the algorithm the algorithm is going to be. However, the more processing power it's going to use, which means it's going to be a lot slower and all these other factors, right? So there's a lot that comes into actually, um, I guess, backing the Defi Hellman or the key exchange behind it, right? So let's look at the algorithm behind it, right? Remember how I said, um, one of the numbers has to be greater than the other, but they both have to be greater than one, right? So let's say we have John and Jane, right? They both have their numbers. That's one is greater than the other, and both are greater than one. Um, John and Jane are basically going to pick two random numbers. And this, these two random numbers are what is actually going to generate the keys, right? The public key or the private key. Um, so John's basically key or result is basically going to be equal to his integer to the power of the random number he just chose, um, modulus by Jane's integer. And then Jane's result is going to be the same thing, right? John's integer 
um, but she's going to use her random integer and then have it be modulus by her integer, right? So you can see it's the same equation, except for John, he's using his random number, and Jane, she's using her random number, all right? Then they're basically going to send their keys, right? John's key and Jane's key, and they're going to send them to each other, and that's going to be able to actually get us the same equated value um, through this algorithm, right? So for example, we have John's data, right? John's data, when it's decrypted, it's basically going to be equal to Jane's result um, to the power of his random number modulus Jane's integer. And then we can see that Jane's data, which is going to be exactly the same as John's data, um, is going to be equal to John's key to the power of her random number modulus Jane's integer. Now, I know that math kind of looked kind of weird, so I have a, an example for you guys to kind of be able to follow along with some more ease, right? So again, we have two numbers that are greater than one, and one of the numbers is greater than the other, right? So this is John's number, this is Jane's number, and they're going to pick two random numbers to generate their keys, right? So if we have the number six, which is John's number, put it to the power of two, which is John's random number, modulus eight, we get the number four. Jane, her result is going to be six because we're basically taking um, John's integer, taking it to the power of one, modulus eight, and we get six. So these are the keys right here, right? Of course, you would have it in a lot, um, in a much higher form factor, right? They're probably going to be in bits or bytes or something like that. But just as a low level understanding, these are their keys, right? What we're going to do from here is they're going to send their keys to each other, and this will result in the same equated value, right? So her, so Jane's key is to the power of John's random number, modulus eight, is going to result in John's data being the number four. And Jane's data with the key of, or John's key, which is four, to her random number, which is one, modulus eight, is also going to be equal to four. So that's how we can have two different keys, but we're both going to have the same exact value as a result, which is pretty cool, right? So that's kind of how a low-level version of asymmetric encryption actually works. Um, so now we're going to talk about RSA. RSA stands for um, the last names of the three developers who made it, and they are, again, the developers of RSA. It is a asymmetric encryption system. Um, RSA is slow. It is a very slow <laughs> encryption algorithm, and it is most likely or most often used to actually encrypt the symmetric keys. So this is why I was talking about how asymmetric encryption and symmetric encryption can kind of be used in coherency. Um, they basically are using asymmetric encryption to encrypt the keys for symmetric encryption because symmetric encryption is a lot faster. So it's kind of like a dual level layer of encryption, which is pretty cool. Um, I do have a link to how RSA works here because RSA uses a lot of complex math and um, it would take oh, it would take a whole nother lecture to explain how RSA actually works. So for the sake of this, just understand that it is an asymmetric algorithm similar to the Daphne Hellman key exchange of how we could get two random values or two separate values as keys and kind of get the same value as a result. Um, so for this example, we're going to use 2,480 or 2,400, oh my gosh, 2,048 bit keys um, for our ciphering process, right? You can see our public key right here has this value, all right? And this again is a 2,048 bit key. And then for our private key, we have this value. These are both 2004, um, 2048 bits. However, they're just in two different form factors to kind of separate them, all right? So when it comes to RSA encryption, we have our plain text. What we're gonna do is take our public key and run it through the RSA encryption. As a result, we're gonna get our cipher text. So if we want to put this in the context of this example, if our plain text is Cosmodium CS, for example, and we take our public key, which is this set of text right here, as a result, our server text is gonna look like this. Cool. So what we're gonna do from here to decrypt is take our cipher text, we're gonna take our private key, run it on each other, and as a result, we will get the plain text, um, set of text from the RSA algorithm process, right? What we're gonna do is look at our cipher text, which is this set of data, our private key, which is this set of data, and as a result, or as a result we get Cosmodium CS as our or as our plain text. Um, that's going to be kind of the conclusion of this all, right? To kind of conclude, uh, cryptography is a very vital concept within the modern world of 
cybersecurity, digital information. Um, it basically is what you know keeps our information secure from hackers, unauthorized users, whether that be the government, whether that be hackers, whether that be your parents going through your computer. Cryptography is what keeps it safe. Um, it kind of just goes to show that hackers will always find a way to bypass it, right? So it is very much on us to make sure that we have a good security hygiene. Um, because if, for example, your password is very complex and it doesn't exist on the rocku.txt database, you could be kind of exempted from a lot of these examples. However, if there were to be a data leak, right, and people were to find your password within that data leak and basically find a way to break that hash or cipher or whatever encryption process it's using, um, they would be able to figure out your password, no matter how secure your password actually is. Um, so thank you. Feel free to check out the YouTube channel and subscribe if you kind of like these types of concepts. I do videos on these um, pretty much every week. And i like to thank um, Alexander for inviting me and kind of sharing some cool examples on how cryptography works. If you guys have any questions, I'll feel free to stay here and answer any questions that you guys may have. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming. Fantastic presentation, thank you. All <laughs> thank right. you so much. Thank you so much. All right. So um